All right, so we'll go on and foot and ankle and talk a little bit more about some bone injuries. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, you know, these just shows if you have the hallux valgus, which we see all the time, there are a number of different treatments. You can do a lateral release, you can do an osteotomy, you can do uh, tightening up of the medial structures or a, a more distal osteotomy. I don't know why. There are only about 60 different operations for that. Right. Okay. Uh, Oleg, what do you think of this case? It's like uh, it was like inferior dislocation on that. Uh, okay. On the cuneiform. Like right, right. So, so to... yeah. So, so this is the 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 distal calcaneus. This is probably the cuboid. Ah, cuboid. <laughs> and <laughs> this patient had prior surgeries, and you can see there's. Uh, significant uh, subluxation here at this joint, so mm -hmm. uh, one of the causes that can be uh, post-traumatic. Okay, so here we're looking at the dorsal talonavicular joint. Right. You see edema and thickening of that capsule. Yeah. Dorsal spurs. Yeah, and then so as you guys have seen uh, over and over again, in most uh, adults, especially older individuals, you'll find that there are degenerative changes involving the dorsal talonavicular joint. But you can also see this in uh, teenage athletes as well. Very common area of uh, repetitive traumatic injury, and it's a common cause of dorsal uh, pain overlying the anterior ankle and the. And the, and the foot, you can see the soft tissue thickening. And as you just said, over time, you tend to get uh, prominent osteophytes here. And we've found that if they get large enough, they can actually lead to anterior impingement. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, uh, here it looks like there's, I guess, some incongruity of the uh, dorsal talonavicular joint and the uh, spur there. Right. And again, this this is a, a common location of, of injuries. Uh, this is called Taylor Beaking. Uh, if you see it in a young person, you need to look, try to find out where the uh, 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 where, where the ballet. Uh, well, it, uh, where the the congenital uh, either fibrous or bony fusion is. A joint, and often it can be the the uh, navicular anterior process of the calcaneus or the subtalar joints, uh, either fibrous or, or, or bony congenital fusions. So that's the classic cause of Taylor Beak. And as John was saying, a repetitive trauma, like you can see with ballerinas, uh, can also produce this condition. Okay, Taysen. All right. Uh, well, ankle mortis looks congruent. Um, there's something there. It's not showing up well on my monitor. Yeah. So it just shows that a lot of boat injuries you don't see well on plain radiographs. So and there maybe there's something there, but uh, it wasn't called prospectively. Uh, but uh, as we all know, bone injuries, MR is much more sensitive at detecting bone injuries than than occult than uh, than X-rays. So, uh, if there is a suspicion of bone injury or pain, even with a negative X-ray, as you all know now, you know, and that may be a, an important indication for doing MR scan. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how to classify ankle fractures because uh, there are a number of different ways to do it. And uh, uh, what I generally find is that most of the 
orthopedic surgeons that, that I deal with really are quite happy with a description of the of the findings rather than going in and trying to determine uh, the actual mechanism of injury. Uh, but uh, there are flowcharts where people have looked into ways of doing this. Uh, but I just find that a description of the findings is usually uh, adequate. Uh, and often I think that the mechanism of injury is better evaluated not by imaging, but by clinical history and uh, physical examination. Okay, uh, Bullock? Uh, um, I guess that's the fracture, like in a, um, like, uh, um, hmm. I don't know. Uh, can, can I form? Yeah, funny. You know, here, like, you have to be careful that you have to really look in three dimensions because there are a lot of joints here, and you can, any one plane, you can partial buy in them, and they can look abnormal when they're, when they're not. So, if, again, if you're concerned about a possible fracture, uh, we can go to MR. See anything on the MR here that would be, concern you? So, so maybe yeah, there's edema here, here yeah. but again, in any one plane, you have to be concerned that you might be partial volumeing the fluid in a joint. So you really have to look at it in multiple planes. Oh, okay. And now, what do you see? And now, now we see the uh, focal edema in the navicular. Right. So the navicular, and so this turned to be an overuse stress injury. Okay. Someone who started running. So injuries to the navicular is one of those bones <clears throat> that are commonly injured. <clears throat> uh, historically, uh, these injuries are called osteonecrosis, but we now know the vast majority are actually due to repetitive trauma and trabecular bone injuries rather than mm -hmm. infarcts to, to the navicular bone. It's a lot like the lunate. The lunate is similar in the, it's kind of the, these are the central bones involving the, uh, the foot and ankle and the, and the wrist, mm -hmm. and it's a common cause of, of trauma. If you continue to have repetitive trauma, as you know, you can actually get compression and collapse of the of the navicular and uh, a, a lot of deformities. There are a lot of names for these. We'll go through some of them in a little bit. But I, I think right now these just need to be recognized as overuse, repetitive traumatic injuries <clears throat> and not osteonecrosis. Or rarely osteonecrosis. If it's osteonecrosis, you need to have a medical diagnosis that would lead to osteonecrosis, and you need to see the more characteristic, specific findings on MR, such as the double line sign. Uh, but but they're quite uncommon in the navicular. Okay, so foot pain after trauma. Um... Okay, and the MR is that the the second metatarsal maybe or I don't know. it's one of one of them. Yeah. yeah, so these are just <clears throat> a lot of these are kind of older slides back in the day. Of it. You you guys are now quite comfortable knowing that MR is a more sensitive technique for bone injuries. Uh, it was actually a hard sell to a lot of people to start using MR to look for bone injuries because. Uh, X-rays were thought to be the definitive answer uh, 30 years ago, but uh, I think you all know now that MR is much more sensitive and that X-ray occult bone injuries are a common cause of foot and ankle pain, just like they're a very common cause of knee pain. Ar Army recruits. Yeah, right. Army recruits is classic for uh, March fractures. Robert. All right, so it looks like we have a pediatric patient here. A little uh, subtle cortical irregularity of that distal fourth yeah. uh, metatarsal. Right. Yeah. Right in there. This this little torus or a buccal fracture right there. And that distal metaphysis, uh, which is more obvious uh, when you look at it on the MR examination. So a torus fracture. 
What, what would you do for that? Um, just immobilize it. Maybe a boot. Um, maybe maybe uh, a cane or something, uh, or a stiff boot. Uh, it, it doesn't need any treatment, really. Okay. It, it'll be fine. Okay, uh, Tayson. All right, so looks like there is a uh, marrow edema in that second metatarsal surrounding soft tissue edema. I'd be worried that there's a fracture here. Yeah, so this was knuckle fracture. In the case like this, if this is all I saw. You, know, you certainly have to be concerned about osteomyelitis, so you need to get the clinical history and uh, make sure that's not what you're dealing with because that could be kind of a semi-medical emergency. Uh, so history is is important for these. Uh. Second metatarsal is the most common one. Uh, it's it, it's a classic. Yeah, it's the longest bone, longest meta, metatarsal bone. Uh, it's a 31 year old female with pain and swelling for three days, no trauma. Um, it's like the, 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 the most edema uh, centered around the, the third. Um, so maybe there, so we can see some edema around the fourth. Fourth, uh, centered around the fourth. Yeah. We go to the coronal images. Um, same edema centered okay. around four. And this is what it looked like uh, on the uh, oblique axial uh, uh, images. So what do you think is going on here? Um, There's no trauma. No trauma. Um, like preserved one more, I guess. I don't know why. You just have the edema around it, right? Around it, yeah. So okay. So, so in a case like this, you know, I'd certainly, if there's no trauma, I'd certainly be concerned about uh, whether this could be infection, could it be a cellulitis, could, mm -hmm. could they have had a penetrating trauma that they that they're not telling us about. So uh, uh, the patient uh, uh, continued to have symptoms and came back about two weeks later, and this is what it looked like. <clears throat> Oh, so now it's my lead displaced fraction, the met, yeah. met fourth metatarsal. So, so if you go back, one of the things to show here is that actually it's rare, <clears throat> but you can get, especially in long bones where you don't have a lot of trabecular bone there, uh, you, you can get edema from fractures in the surrounding soft tissue or periosteum and not actually see the acute fracture on the, the, the straight uh, MR examination. This patient went on to complete the fracture and get some displacement, and now you've got bony reactive change in the area uh, where the fracture was. So it is possible to have bone injuries uh, where the, the bone is still pretty normal in the acute stage with MR scan. So MR is very sensitive, uh, but in the acute setting, it's it's still not 100%. Yeah, this, this patient should have been immobilized and on crutches. Yeah, uh, because now the treatment is uh, not not as easy as one might think. This is not an area that heals very easily. Yeah, and if you notice that metatarsal is shortened, it's not as long as it was before. Yeah, so there's overlap. Right. So this may require a surgical procedure with grafting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tayson, did you read? Did you do that one? No, uh, that was Oleg. Oleg, oh, yeah. sorry about that. Okay, nineteen-year-old trauma, six toe pain. Sorry, two phalanges off the fifth metatarsal. So uh, oh, congenital trauma <laughs> here. Yeah, and I noticed that. The sixth one is fractured. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, Robert. All right, so we have a two-month-old or two-year-old man. Uh, uh, two, oh. yeah, two-year-old yeah. male. Yeah. Limping for one month. Uh, can't say that I see a definitive abnormality on these images, but ah, uh, oh, yeah, there's definitely a, a uh, looks like a spiral fracture. This uh, toddler's fracture. And and here we can see that on CT scan the the fracture and the the healing response. So we can see there, yeah, and that's a follow up, and this is a toddler's fracture. Good. That's, uh, yeah, they, 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 they age group, like two year olds and so on. They do a lot of climbing over furniture and, mm-hmm. and furniture, and, and that's very common to have fractures of the wrist, etc. Yeah. And you can also get metatrosal fractures. So kids can get a lot of, a lot of fractures that can be very subtle, especially on, on X-rays. Jason. All right, thirty-four-year-old male, left foot pain, rope swinging, and hitting rock with the foot forward. Symptoms for one week. All right, so I see. Marrow edema at the second and less of the third metatarsal base. Yeah, uh, I think the Liz Frank is very attenuated. If it is there, I, I might see a little low signal band on the yeah on the right image, but yeah. But in a setting like that, uh, it's not nice and black, which it should be on the fat suppressed images. And if you don't see a nice black continuous line, then it's torn until proven otherwise. Yeah. And especially when you see uh, edema on the adjacent base of the of the second. And you can then look at the coronal images, and you should be able to see a multi-strided appearance. Usually you can see three bands in the coronal plane, sometimes only two. Here we can see that uh, we don't see continuous uh, black bands there. Uh, yeah. And uh, so. Let's see what Brian has for us here. And here we can actually see that there are other fractures here, which we know at the base of the third. Yeah, so it's a Liz Frank tear, and Liz Frank was uh, back in the early 1800s. Uh, classically, classically caused by a sol- soldier who falls from a horse with it when his foot gets caught in a stirrup. So when uh, Elior goes to Texas with all the horsemen there, he can look for this injury uh, from, from the equestrians. More commonly, we see it in uh, contact injuries, and especially with uh, plantar base. And then, <laughs> was the treatment at that in those days? And uh, the fastest amputator uh, at the time, uh-huh. I think it was uh, Napoleon's army. Right. And I think he was Napoleon's physician, if I can recall correctly. I believe that's correct. And there we can see widening the list, Frank. We we don't amputate today, we try to reduce it. And uh, you you cannot accept any misplacement, so you, yeah. You, it's a very common in the old days, maybe even today, one of the most common areas for litigation. Right. Yeah. And here you can see more severe injuries where you can get uh, uh, displacement and marked instability along the metatarsal tarsal articulations. Okay. So we, and then this is just more comminuted fractures. 
just shows how it's... Uh, we, in, in my day, we said early on, it, we tried to reduce these, uh, but for many times it was unsuccessful. So surgery was a thing. Okay. Uh, K wires or screws, whatever. Um, you, you did what you found and what you had to do. Okay. Um, we didn't have MRIs, unfortunately, but yeah, uh, we got by. Good. Okay. Not an uncommon injury. Yeah, just showing some of the oblique imaging that, that people have done. That just shows the anatomy. It goes from the base of the second over to the uh, medial cuneiform. And for the imaging. And the... We didn't try to specifically suture the tendons or anything, or ligaments, but mm -hmm. uh, rather put the bones back together and then um, Fix them in place. Okay, great. Say, so who's next? I think me. You? Sixty-year-old female in ankle sprain. Um. So we have a, a, a fractious section. Um, so the medial malleolus, the medial malleolus fracture. Here. Then we have fracture of the uh, uh, posterior malleolus or tibia. Mm -hmm. And then we can and see. And then we also have fibula. Yeah, which is more kind of in the oblique coronal plane of the fibula. There's the fibular fracture. Uh, a trimalleolar fracture. Right. Mm -hmm. And. <laughs> I think uh, cl clinically, we we've I think already talked a little bit about uh, the different classifications of the mechanism of injuries uh, uh, in, in these uh, type, and there are a number of different classification systems. Uh, generally, uh, if when you get out in practice, if you work with a foot surgeon who really really wants you to go into this, there are criteria that you can use to try to. Uh, to uh, <clears throat> categorize uh, these fractures. Generally, what I've found is that uh, most of the referring physicians just want a description of uh, where the fractures are, and then they uh, determine whether it's uh, necessary for surgery, which these kind of fractures would be, and then they just go in and try to fix them anatomically. John, do you have any any further well, things? Uh, Trimalleolar fractures. So. Almost always need a surgical intervention. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, there was a um, disagreement among some how many bones you fix. Um, some people just fix the medial malleolus and left the fibula alone and whatever. Um, but uh, I think. Uh, um, Nowadays, it's uh, more aggressive in terms of surgical procedures. Yeah, right. Thank you. Okay, so 13 year old pronation inversion external rotation injury. We see a Salter Harris type three fracture in the medial. Uh, yeah. And then uh, again, I, I don't want to spend, uh, we went into this before, right? So. I, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on the the different mechanisms uh, of, of of injuries. Uh, I think often it's it's inconclusive just based upon imaging alone. Uh, but again, I think it's best just to describe the the planes and the location and the amount of displacement and angulation of the different frag fragments. Okay. Uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 16-year-old with ankle pain after a football injury. Uh, looks like there is a tear of that deep deltoid ligament. Okay. Right here. A lot of, a lot of edema at the ankle. Okay, here are the axial images. Here it looks like there's 
a tear of that anterior inferior uh, tibiofibular ligament. Right. So, uh, so often, again, a lot of different descriptions, so forth. Uh, but here now, there are some uh, articles which will say that when you have an ankle sprain, that you initially tear the anterior talofibular ligament, and if the mechanism is more severe, the forces are higher, then you'll go up and tear the anterior inferior uh, tibiofibular ligament. Uh, I, I don't think that's correct. Actually, a very large number of anterior tibiofibular ligament uh, injuries that I've seen, the anterior talofibular ligament is intact. So uh, I don't think that other progression is really correct. In this particular case, the anterior talofibular ligament was uh, in, intact. So I think yeah, it, the situation is that the ankle is a very complex joint. Uh, there's a lot of degrees of motion, and there are a lot of different uh, joints that can be involved. Uh, and uh, I think it's often uh, a little bit confusing and maybe inaccurate to, to classify the mechanism of injury just based upon uh, the imaging findings. So personally, I found that it, it works just fine to uh, describe the, the different ligamentous injuries and bone injuries uh, <clears throat> rather than trying to get into the a description of the mechanism of injury. John, is that, is that okay I, with I you? I'll go along with that because... With every injury, there is more tor there's torsion as well as uh, other motions, and, and and you're just guessing at that most of the time. It, it, uh, at surgery, you find out what ligaments are torn, etc. But um, you can see that on MRI also. Uh, the decision as to surgery is up to the physician, actually. That's operating. Um, uh, some of these can be treated uh, with a cast, and I've done that many, many times. Um, some of them need to be operated on. Um, it depends on how well you can reduce them. If you can reduce them and keep them reduced with a cast, that's the best way to do it. If you cannot, then you operate. operate. Okay, thank you. And the one thing to remember is that with uh, some of these fractures, you can also have an associated proximal tibial fracture, as we can see here, a mesonuve type fracture. Here we can see uh, a disruption of the mortise joint with uh, obviously a tear of the deep deltoid and displacement of the talus uh, with respect to the tibial plafond. In this case, we also have a comminuted proximal fibular fracture. I think nowadays uh, it's definitely a surgical case. Yeah. I think it used to be when I was growing up, too. Okay, yeah, I think so. And here we can see separation of the uh, here between the distal fibula and the and the distal tibia with M, with uh, x-rays to see these syndesmotic tears. You look for displacement of the bones. A uh, number of studies have shown that much more sensitive way is to look at it with MR, and with tears of the syndesmotic ligaments, you almost always will get uh, fluid uh, collecting in between uh, the bones here, whereas if you have other injuries but you don't have fluid here and, and no separation, uh, then that's a very reliable sign that the syndesmotic ligaments are not torn. So it's really well, looking for fluid in this location on an MR. Yes, John? Well, first we had uh, X-rays, and then we had uh, uh, was that a, a procedure that was done to a tomography, and yeah. then we had C CT scan. Now, once the CT scan came into existence, there was a period of time before MRI came around. Right. So a lot of a lot of orthopods and and radiologists. Um, I used the CTs, and and it took them all quite a while to get into MRIs. So um, a lot of the literature is, uh, in, uh, they were talking about CT. So if you grew up with a CT, that's what you depend on. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's pretty much transitioned to MR now. 
I think you're it, right. John. It, it, it took a took a while, and sometimes uh, sometimes you really it's best to have both CT and MR. Uh, well, there are you times when you need both. Well. Yep. <clears throat> and this just shows the Mazenu fracture, as it says here. Exactly the exact mechanism of injury is debated, but typically with a Mazenouf type fracture, you'll get disruption of the mortise joint, and then you'll have a tear which will extend proximally through the interosseous membranes here, all the way up to the proximal fracture side on the fibula. That's what makes it a surgical case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, who was last? I know. Uh, Taysen. All right. So, I think this is a fracture through the distal fibula. Okay. Um, not exactly sure what this low signal structure is, though. So this is another situation like we've talked to before, where this patient has had a fracture going through the growth plate. There's a tear of the periosteum. This opened up at the time of uh, the injury, and the periosteum flipped into the, into the growth plate area. Okay. Can a periosteum be that thick in a 55-year-old female, John? Well, it is in this case. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I, it, it, it might be yeah. a ligament. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, th I think this. Uh, 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 no, or, this or. is from someone else. So I, uh, they, they just called it a trap periosteum. Uh, this was in a non-pediatric case, as you can see. This was actually a, a fracture, and uh, I think this is one. I, I don't know that I've ever noticed this reading cases. I think this is the only one I've seen that's really occurred with a fracture and a non-pediatric patient that with a periosteum got trapped in the fracture. In this case, it was surgically proven. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know why, uh, if I would have operated on that, I probably would have put a cast on. I'm sure you wouldn't have. We've discussed that many times. Yeah, uh, that that was in the young people. Though. That's true. Fifty-five yeah. years old, so that puts me in a far more conservative area. Yeah. And most of the pediatrics you wouldn't operate on, so. Right. So what do you think? Oh, I mean, I mean. Ah, uh, so that's that's written. So it's a okay. fraction. So, so here we can yeah, see a fraction. fraction here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's the MR scan showing the complicated fraction. Yeah, went and operated. Um, okay. Let's go in here. Uh, Okay, 24-year-old, ankle pain two weeks after snowboarding. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we see edema in that lateral talus. It looks like there's a fracture. Right. Two fragments here. Yeah, this is actually called a snowboarder's fracture, mm -hmm. involving the lateral uh, process of the talus uh, here and with an impaction against the distal fibula. And there's that fracture fragment with the displacement. And that we saw one of these earlier where the fracture displaced and then healed, and that patient ended up then having a lateral bony impingement. So uh, getting these to heal without significant displacement is important in prognosis. So now this is a snowboarder fracture. Okay. And then here we just had a Taylor fracture, which extends into the uh, subtalar joint space. Okay, and another trabecular bone injury, Taylor fracture involving the inferior cortex here, an impaction injury. 
in this kind of injury. So nowadays we turn over to guys that specialize in feet, orthopedic surgeons that specialize in feet. Okay. Uh, say Robert. All right, so we have a 17 year old with shin splints and lateral pain with increased running. A concern for perineal subluxation or tear. Uh, I see a fracture of that distal fibular diaphysis. Yeah, probably. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. And then there, there's a big discussion in this particular case as to uh, what this high signal intensity is here. It's a fit failure, fat suppression. Go to the ideal technique, you can see that it's uh, uh, not high signal. This is just uh, from the inhomogeneity of the coil and failure of fat suppression. And this is just a stress fracture from overuse. I think there's also feeling going on in here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the periosteum, on the, uh, you, you see some. Uh, I don't know whether that's callus or not, but that sure looks like it. Yeah, it probably is some. Yeah. In that area, yeah. Right. So, but why why would these people wait so long to 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 go to a doctor? I don't know. Well, you know, they're they're runners and they have a lot of endorphins. Well, I all that's those endorphins again. Yeah. There you go. It, Okay, Tayson, this, this patient had foot pain. All right, so I guess we're looking at the base of the uh, first MTP joint. I think there's a, an injury to the tibial hallucesimoid. Right here, right. Yeah, again, that's a sesamoid fracture is also from, from running. Here's a little bit more of a chronic case where you can also see the Injury to the uh, to the sesamoid there. Uh, some of these are operated on, and uh, the tiny screws are put in to put them back together, because some of these will not heal. Um, and they're tiny screws. We didn't have in my day, but they have them now. And there's okay. the manufacturer of the sesamoid one. Okay, and then here's a. Another, this is more the kind of fracture that they might put a screw in that John was just yeah. talking about. Right. And then yeah, they're um, not easy to heal. Yeah. Okay. Of course, it's up to the patient to decide. So, um, you're given the best advice you can, and then let them decide. Okay. Yeah, so here the lateral sesamoid looks retracted. There's fluid. Um, over here. Are you talking about over here? On the sagittal view, is that the sesamoid? A little more yeah. proximal there? I think this is this area here. Probably dealing with the medial sesamoid here. Oh, okay. Rather than the, the, the lateral. I don't see good fat signal on this uh, T2 weighted image. So I, I'd be concerned that the lateral might also be abnormal. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and then sometimes uh, having multiple planes is really important for evaluating these here. It's a little bit hard to see on the on the axial images, we can actually see a fluid, a defect in the, the fracture site here. And this is a patient who was a football player and had symptoms of turf toe. And this was a turf toe due to a fracture of the sesamoid. Uh, these are operated on all these. Yeah. And turf toe itself uh, uh, can be a complicated uh, process. Uh, there are a lot of different structures here that can be. Uh, uh, damaged with sports and uh, overuse activities. There's the plantar plate here. There's the inner sesamoid ligament, the sesamoid bone themselves, and then you've got the sesamoid phalangeal ligaments on both sides, uh, <clears throat> as well as the metatarsal sesamoid ligaments. And then you've got the uh, 
flexor hallucis brevis muscles on both sides. So this is a very complicated joint, and injuries to any of these structures can actually give you a turf toe symptoms. Uh, so when was the concept of turf toe first recognized? Does anybody know? Actually, we'll ask the Texan here. You know? No, I don't. Well, it has to do with the Texas phenomenon. <clears throat> so turf toe has probably been around for a long time, but it became a very big issue uh, when they developed the, uh, when they built the uh, Astrodome in Houston so that you could uh, have sports activity in the summer in, in Houston, which otherwise was pretty difficult without air conditioning. And uh, since they couldn't grow grass, they had to have artificial turf, which has a, a very different uh, padding than, than uh, real turf. And so what happened is people who played there, because they, there wasn't much give on the floor, uh, they would develop these repetitive injuries to the foot because of the impaction. And instead of having kind of low-frequency vibrations at the impaction because the turf would kind of dampen the impact, uh, you would have high-frequency vibrations at the impact of the foot and the ground uh, when you were dealing with, uh, uh, not, with artificial turf. And that led to a lot of injuries, and that's really when turf toe became a, a common problem that was associated with the Astrodome. And then, yeah, it's been around for a long time, and yeah. uh, they went to a, a different shoe from uh, a shoe that you use on grass. Um, and got to do with the cleats. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then and then they've gone through a lot of different iterations of changing oh, sure. the the turf itself. And actually, if you notice now, most stadiums, even outdoor stadiums now. When people hit the ground in football, often you'll see this little black cloud that comes up from the ground, and that's the uh, uh, the the turf. Now, even if it's outdoors and it's regular grass, that they use turf now that that can uh, uh, cushion the impaction much better than even just standard dirt, dirt does to decrease injuries. Uh, so, uh, almost all the fields now will have a a similar type uh, turf uh, 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 because of the substrate that's used for both grass and, and artificial covering to to give proper protection for the athletes. I think grass is still the preferred by most yeah. people out on the field. Right. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who's next. Anybody know? Robert, why don't you take it? Sure. Uh, so we have a 26 year old female first MTP pain after MVA two months ago. Rule out tibial sesamoid fracture. Uh, that tibial sesamoid looks like it's retracted. Probably there's a tear of that plantar plate. Yeah. And if we come down here, we can see the tear over here, the retraction, and even a little bit of edema and that medial sesamoid in there. And if we follow it with multiple images, we can see the abnormality here. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a, this actually was a sesamoid fracture with displacement at the fracture. And this patient came in with symptoms of turf toe. Tayson. All right, so there is definitely edema within the sesamoid bone. Uh, a lot of high signal where I think the uh, flexor hallucis brevis is supposed to attach, and the where I would expect the sesamoid phalangeal ligament to be it looks indistinct as well. Okay, here are the coronal edges. So you can see an uh, abnormal signal over here. Here's the, the flexor tendon. Here's the lateral sesamoid, medial sesamoid. And then on the axial images here, you can actually see there were 
looking at these in all three planes can be very helpful. Here you have the fracture going through the sesamoid. Mm. Mm. So uh, it uh, so it looks like uh, uh, it's like um, a lateral displacement of the uh, sesamoids, right? And <clears throat> this is not turf toe. Uh, <clears throat> this is actually relatively commonly seen. And elderly individuals, especially notice here, this, this patient is actually not ambulating, marked atrophy of the intrinsic muscles of the mm -hmm. foot. But with degenerative disease, there's a tendency to get uh, displacement of the, of the sesamoid bones like we see here. And what you actually have now is that the flexor tendon is pulling at the wrong angle, and this is often associated with uh, hallux valgus deformity of the foot. And then here we just have a little Salter Harris one fracture. Okay, so here looking at the uh, lateral distal tibia. Um, not a lot of edema there, but there's this irregularity that looks like a fracture that extends to that yeah yeah too i saw it too okay robert all right uh don't see a whole lot there is some irregularity of the uh, tibial epiphysis yeah 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 so maybe a, maybe there's, a the, or... there's the mr yeah so there's a a fracture there that extends through the physis and epiphysis and even um yeah. yeah yeah even the distal metaphysis so this would be a salter harris four right good with displacement a little bit of angulation yeah okay tason all right so we're looking at the Second metatarsal head looks like there's a subchondral injury there. Yeah. Here are the sagittal images showing the bone edema and maybe a little bit of flattening of the subchondral bone. Yeah. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> is this a male or a female? Um, I'm I'm going to guess a female. But... Okay. Yeah, it could be either, actually, but this is more, much more commonly seen in females. This is a second metatarsal head, and, and if you remember, John, earlier in the lecture said that the most common metatarsal injury is a second metatarsal, and this is kind of, this is the reason the second metatarsal is actually the longest, and if you uh, go around wearing your high heels, uh, you tend to get a lot of stress right on the distal uh, second metatarsal uh, head. And uh, so this is a, a classic uh, Freiburg's infraction and is highly associated with wearing high heel shoes. Okay. Um, so we have um, uh, edema in the uh, Head of the metatarsal, I don't know which one. Uh, in the head of the second metatarsal, right? Um, and that's, uh, I guess, it's a fracture. Yeah, so another fiber so fracture. Ah, right. yep. Okay, fracture. Yep. yep. Eleven-year-old left heel pad pain, right lateral. Pain. Yeah, the calcaneus, uh, the image on the left, calcaneus there, it looks irregular. There's a cortical irregularity laterally. I'd be concerned about a fracture. Excellent. CT. Is a, yeah, is it on the right? Uh, yeah, right there. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, mm. Okay, base of the fifth metatarsal. I don't, I'm not sure though. Could be an apophysis. I, okay. But it, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, this usually is uh, fused by, by 16, uh, fuses earlier in girls than it is in boys, uh, can uh, often be confused uh, w with a fracture and uh, can be ace at, at around the uh, 11 to 16 year in the early teens, you can actually, they can fuse at different times and therefore it can become confusing. And here is, we can see, it's the typical the direction of the uh, apophysis as opposed to this. Well, so we can see here, let's see, it's very longitudinal uh, there. And then th these can be uh, injured by, uh, of course, the, this is very close to the insertion of the peritoneus brevis. And you can get symptoms in this location. This patient also has an os perineum uh, in this area where you can actually get separation on the symptomatic side and not the other. So occasionally hypertrophic formation, kind of like a little league's elbow sort of thing. And if you do that, that's called apophysitis. It's actually a traumatic injury. It's not inflammation. Uh, it's it's really a healing injury of a, of a uh, basically a salter one. Uh, avulsion injury of the of the apophysis there and it's called is insulin disease and it's treated by rest and there are a bunch of secondary ossicles some of which we've already talked about in the area in this particular area they can be variations in size and shape uh, again clinically these are, I mean, not clinically, uh, in many publications, these are thought to be congenital variants. But as we talked about, I think the vast majority of these are actually uh, acquired conditions. I agree with you on that, John. Thank you. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 53-year-old male with lateral pain after a twisting injury. Uh I don't see any fracture or dislocation. There's a, I guess, a well corticated ossicle adjacent to the uh, cuboid bone. Yeah. Yeah. And on the MR, it looks edematous. Yeah, it looks Maybe like it, fractured. Yeah. And it, yeah. It looks like there's a little black mm -hmm. area going through it. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Um, here, yeah. So it looks like a, this is actually a, a fracture of a perineal ossicle. Mm. Conservative treatment. Uh, let's see. Why don't we stop here, and we'll talk about the fifth metatarsal base uh, tomorrow. And so I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Right. You too. Thank you. Thank you. See you manana. Manana. <laughs>